Let's open our Bibles this afternoon to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As I said, I'm uh, substituting in for Brother Jade here first hour to lay a foundation and set the tone for a message from Brother Mark second hour about famines. And as I said, Mark gave me a general idea of where his message is headed. I've not seen his outline though, so I'm going to do my best here first hour not to steal any of his thunder, as they say. We read as follows in 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. While Paul may not have realized it, I think the last days and perilous times he warned about here were for him, for the most part, far off in a distant future. Some of these things he's warning about are signs of apostasy within the church among Christians. Let's open our Bibles this afternoon to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As I said, I'm uh, substituting in for Brother Jade here first hour to lay a foundation and set the tone for... Uh, Message from Brother Mark, second hour, about famines. And as I said, Mark gave me a general idea of where his message is headed. I've not seen his outline, though, so I'm going to do my best here first hour not to steal any of his thunder, as they say. We read as follows in 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. While Paul may not have realized it, I think the last days and perilous times he warned about here were for him, for the most part, far off in a distant future. Some of these things he's warning about are signs of apostasy within the church among Christians. Others are out in the pagan world. But the point of the message today is that These things are no more out far off in the distant future because the perilous times that Paul warned about have arrived. I believe they are here now. These five verses define and describe our modern culture really to a T, do they not? The seeds of atheism and Marxism that were planted in the 19th century by Darwinian evolution have now borne fruit in a post-Christian, anti-Christian Society that has completely rejected God altogether and that has no moral compass whatsoever, that has become every bit as wicked as was the antediluvian culture that existed before the flood of Noah, I believe. And this past Friday, as Mary and I were traveling down uh, to Brooksville, she asked me, uh, someone out of the blue, how could Sodom and Gomorrah have been any worse than the American culture that has become today? And we agreed together that to a large extent, and as has grown much worse over the past few years, I believe, American culture today has become just as wicked, if not more so, than Sodom and Gomorrah was. And is just as deserving of the same judgment today. Paul says here in verse 2, In that day men shall be lovers of their own selves, meaning they'll be selfish in the extreme with no care or concern for others. He says they'll be covetous, meaning they're not content with what God has given them. They want what belongs to others. Boasters and proud, 
having no humility, thinking of themselves as superior to others and being more deserving of favor, blasphemers, daring to speak evil of God himself, to mock, belittle, speak evil of the Lord Jesus and constantly misusing and taking his holy name in vain, disobedient to parents, to a frightening extent many of today's generation of juveniles has gone way beyond disobedience to parents, to being sociopathic criminals and gangsters. They've been raised in godless public schools and single-parent homes, many of them by mothers who are themselves strung out on drugs while trying to live off the failed American welfare state. Disobedient to parents is uh, putting it mildly for our generation today. Unthankful, thinking themselves and deserving far more than they are given, not thankful for what they have. Unholy. Here and throughout these verses, Paul describes also apostasy among those who call themselves Christian, but who show zero, true to the spirit, and they revel in a pagan lifestyle. Verse 3, without natural affection. This is speaking specifically in regard to one's own children, actually, referring to fathers thoughtlessly abandoning their children, or mothers walking into abortion clinics to have them murdered, much like the Canaanites who sacrificed their own children to Molech. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means having no self-control, unable to resist temptations to sin, or who readily yield or run headlong into it. Fierce, meaning violent and cruel toward others. Despisers of those that are good, in particular despisers of Christians who serve the Lord who, by the way, will still be present on earth when in these prophesied last days, when these perilous times have come. Verse 4, traitors, having no loyalty to family or friends. Traitors, that being a word that, except for very few, presently describes almost every politician in Washington, D.C., by the way. They're traitors to the Constitution, traitors to the people that voted them into office. But sadly, this also, this word traitors also describes Many preachers in the pulpits across this land who have sold out and surrendered Christ's lordship to the supremacy of the state. Heady, high-minded, meaning puffed up with pride, self-conceit. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Here again, Paul is condemning of those who claim to be Christian but who show themselves to be make-believers. As he does in verse 5, also having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof preaching a false gospel of easy believism that denies repentance from sin, denies the transforming power of regeneration, and basically claims that Christian can revel in sin and live it up and still be saved. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Then Paul says, from such, turn away. That state of these five verses, I believe, define and describe our modern culture to a T. American culture today has, I believe, become just as wicked, if not more so, than Sodom and Gomorrah, and is just as deserving of the same judgment. And therefore, I believe that we can say that the perilous times Paul warned about have arrived. They're here now. Throughout the Bible, God judged Israel and other nations by turning them over to their enemies to be destroyed. And in the perilous times of these last days, the Bible says God will turn this world over for a time to mankind's greatest enemy, that being Satan the devil. During that time, as we read in Revelation 12, 11, God will still have an elect remnant of his saints here on this earth who haven't been raptured out, like the pre-tribbers believe. They'll still be here to continue preaching the gospel and bearing witness to the truth of whom John says that Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him. They overcome Satan, who the world has been turned over to for judgment. But God's saints who are still here overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they love not their lives unto the death. And we may well in days to come be required to sacrifice our lives for the Lord Jesus. But then we read at the very next verse. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. We're not quite at this verse yet in Revelation, 
on God's prophetic time clock, but I do believe the day is drawing very near. Three weeks ago, and then again last week, I focused a bit on the schemes and the devices of the globalist cabal and how they are working overtime in our day to bring global government to pass. And their only possible motivation for so doing, being driven by the devil that they serve, whether they do so knowingly or not, to finally institute that long prophesied global kingdom of the devil's antichrist. As we've seen was prefigured by uh, Nimrod's kingdom of Babel in Genesis 10 to 11. Nimrod was the world's first king who, again, united all mankind of his day under his dominion, just as the coming antichrist prophesied multiple places throughout the Bible, will be given power or authority over all kindreds and tongues and nations, as we read in Revelation 13, 7. In preparation for which, again, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, has for centuries had his devotees who gathered in their secret societies and Masonic lodges, and now in their private Bilderberg meetings and their World Economic Forum conferences to plot and scheme to bring about that global government to pass who, again, Satan has enriched with the wealth of this world to infiltrate, to conquer, and to take control over the governments of this world to ultimately destroy all resistance to his new world order, which centuries-long effort, I believe, appears very close to becoming a reality. But as is clearly depicted by the text of Revelation 17 and also demonstrated by many other historical and current evidences, that effort to implement the devil's new world order is and has been coordinated and overseen through the Vatican in Rome, as we talked about last week. And the devil's cabal keeps inching closer and closer to that goal of world government using a multifaceted, multi-pronged strategy we talked about last two messages. That strategy includes total control over the flow of information, censoring of truth, to allow the devil, his false prophet, the Pope, and and his Jesuit order, which controls major network media, to allow them to deceive those that dwell on the earth. That strategy also includes the Jesuits' centuries-old MO, their modus operandi of the fomenting and use of warfare, both between nations and within nations, civil war in other words, to divide and to conquer and gain control over nations as the Jesuits once turned the American colonies against the British crown. That was at the time a form of civil war. And we now see Jesuit Joe Biden and his administration, and the CIA and the Department of Defense and the so-called Department of Homeland Security, even now fomenting social unrest and civil war in America to, I believe, put the final nail in the coffin of the U.S. Constitution, which... Frankly, they haven't followed for well over a century anyway, turning the so-called constitutionalist patriots against the Marxist rulers in Washington, D.C., while opening the borders to bring in millions of illegal immigrants, begging for handouts, along with who knows how many tens of thousands of mercenaries from China and who knows where else, to provoke and to stoke the fire of what I and many others see as a coming civil war in America, as portrayed also in a soon-to-be-released feature movie we talked about, I think coming out in April, titled Civil War. This being a very important, pivotal presidential election year, I believe we could easily see such a civil war taking place either before the elections in November or soon following, depending on the outcome. In fact, I think that we can see a perfect storm gathering Uh, in which several planned crises could erupt on the planet all at once in the coming few months, including, as we talked about last week, what appears to be a new pandemic on the way that the World Health Organization and the WEF has been planning for two years now, at least, or more, actually, via the possible release, and as I said, any day now, of a new pathogen that they're currently calling Disease X. On top of that, Joe Biden, Jesuit Joe, continues to promise Ukraine hundreds more billions in U.S. so-called taxpayer dollars to keep them fighting Russia. After we're also told that we have no more weaponry to send them, 
and they sure can't buy it from Russia or anywhere else. So how Jesuit Joe is going to help them, I don't know. Jesuit Joe also continues to pass along the papal blessing from Papa Orhe Bergoglio upon Israel's continued genocide of the Palestinian people of Gaza, fomenting war with surrounding Arab and Muslim nations. And why Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, and Egypt have not already declared war on Israel uh, to come to Gaza's aid, I don't know, but that may well be coming soon. I presume that most of you probably watched Tucker Carlson's interview of Vladimir Putin the week before last. Most watched uh, interview in world history, by the way. I think Tucker Carlson is now more popular globally than Donald Trump is, having now become somewhat of an international news journalist of the world via his website and his program on Elon Musk's, Elon Musk's X platform. Interestingly, if you watch that video, Putin made mention in that interview of Tucker's one-time application to join the CIA, work for the CIA. As I just said, his father had also done, while he was serving as a director of the Voice of America, an overseas propaganda radio station, he was also president of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and he was U.S. ambassador to, uh, it's pronounced Achilles, I guess, an island nation in the Indian Ocean. That was Tucker's father. When Putin mentioned Tucker's application to the CIA, Tucker didn't bat an eye or seem at all surprised, causing many to suspect that Tucker is actually serving the CIA himself. Personally, I find that to be maybe possible. Uh, but somewhat doubtful, really, considering the amount of actual forbidden truth that I believe Tucker is getting out to the world. Through that interview and many others, including one he did, a really good interview he did with Brett Weinstein, Dr. Brett Weinstein, about the World Health Organization's Pandemic Preparedness Treaty. That blew the lid off the cabal's lies regarding the globalist aims of that treaty and also the massive genocide that was implemented through those jabs. I do think it's possible, though, Tucker may uh, possibly be an insider with the CIA, his role being to limit the debate and control the opposition, especially given Tucker's very well-connected family tree, his mother being heir to the Swanson Foods fortune, and being the niece of Senator J. William Fulbright, along with Tucker's profession of the Episcopal religion, which is, of course, very closely related to Roman Catholicism. I also find it very interesting, though, that within just a few days after that interview, Tucker was invited to be a featured speaker at the United Arab Emirates Annual World Government Summit, World Government Summit that they have every year there at Dubai. That conference having a very interesting name, I might add, where Tucker was interviewed before a large, mostly Arab audience by an Egyptian journalist named Ahmad Adib. Very interesting interview in which after Tucker talked about how Russian cities are so much cleaner and prettier than, the, than American cities these days. Didn't used to be that way, he said, but they sure are now. He criticized Biden's pressing of the war in Ukraine, and he talked quite a bit about Jesuit Joe Biden's obvious dementia for this worldwide audience now and Joe's mental incapacity. Tucker was then asked why he thinks Jesuit Joe uh, continues to refuse to stop Israel's warfare against the people of Gaza, uh, which, by the way, he could do instantaneously. He could tell them to stop, and it would stop. To which Tucker gave an interesting answer, uh, wrapped in an illustration, saying that as the most powerful nation on earth, America is somewhat in the position of a father of a family who sees two sons fighting and has a responsibility to stop the fight and find out what caused it, get to the bottom of it. But then, then he said as follows, so if you see a nation with awesome power abetting war for its own sake, you have a leadership that has no moral authority, that's illegitimate, and I mean that too. I'm not even referring to any specific religion or conflict. I'm generally and deeply offended by that, deeply, and it's something that I try to express. I'm often called a traitor for saying that, because I believe in the United States, I think it's amoral. It has been a morally superior country, and if we allow our leaders to use our power to spread destruction for its sake, that is shameful. He says it's a black and white. It's a zero one. If you're either creating or you're destroying, you're either improving or you're degrading. And that's how you know whether something is good or bad, whether it's virtuous or evil. 
He said, and I'm very distressed and concerned that we are entering an era where this awesome force for good, United States military, etc., power, awesome force for good is instead being used for evil. Well, I'm not sure if uh, that interview was canned or scripted, but I, for one, am uh, glad that Tucker called America's support of Israel's actions evil in front of that very Arab audience, because that is indeed a very evil agenda, as we've covered before and in some depth. But I do believe that Tucker Carlson should and does know very well that for many decades now, and in fact throughout much of its empire-building history, America has used its military power as a force of evil throughout the world, and that sure didn't start with Jesuit Joe Biden. That's been going on for many decades. And, uh, in fact, throughout much of America's history. You look at the, their history in the Philippines and how we've taken over you know, islands in the Pacific, etc. That said, though, I think for the present, I'm, I'm giving Tucker the benefit of the doubt since I do believe he's putting out a lot of good information that it seems that Cabal would not want to get out. On to another issue now we, know, we all need to be aware of and for preparing for days to come. Most of us heard the announcement made in recent days that Russia is developing what's being called a troubling nuclear-powered space-based anti-satellite weapon. You guys heard about that? Moscow allegedly downplayed the claims, describing them as a malicious fabrication and a White House plot to try and secure the passage of Jesuit Joe's multi-billion dollar Ukrainian aid package through Congress. The fact is, this is all disinformation. Uh, because for decades, ever since Ronald Reagan announced his SDI Star Wars Initiative defense program, the U.S., Russia, and China have all been developing space-based weapon systems for, <laughs> for years, decades now, including nuclear-powered X-ray lasers designed not only to take out satellites, but also to take out ICBM missiles, nuclear missiles. And reportedly, the U.S. is way ahead of the pack in that technology. And so... Uh, they're just not letting out what they, what, what they know to be true, feigning weakness. But so this latest announcement, um, while it's only a half-truth, is dangerous. And I'm going to tell you why. And as Alex Jones has suggested, this may be a stage-setting announcement for a false flag EMP strike uh, by the U.S. to take out our electrical grid and then to be blamed on the Russians. And I think that's highly possible. Uh, this, too, is possibly one more of the combined planned events designed to spark World War III and finally the beginning of the tribulation period, and that's going to be coming. That tribulation period we read of in Revelation uh, begins, as we have studied somewhat in depth, with the loosing of the first two sealed judgments in Revelation 6, the first of which is the Antichrist's rise to political power, second of which is the outburst of global warfare. When the Bible says peace is taken from the earth, that's that second seal. As mentioned last week, the World Health Organization is wrangling to get all member nations to cede their political power uh, to the World Health Organization and ratify the Pandemic Preparedness Treaty by May 27th of this year, which is indeed one more huge step in the ultimate implementation of world government under the Antichrist. But I believe that will be accompanied by several others. There's going to be, I believe, several at once here, possibly including the release of another pathogen, another pandemic, another round of attempts at government-imposed <laughs> mandates, possibly accompanied by an attack on the electrical grid, knocking America back to the days of the 1800s, for which no one is prepared, causing untold confusion, famine, and social unrest right here at home. Of course, we should be prepared and also possibly taken by Russia and China as a preemptive measure to a nuclear attack, causing them to launch their nukes. I mean, all kinds of things could happen. Who knows? I mean, it, what's going to happen is mayhem's going to break loose one of these days. Babble all over again. Confusion. And so I do believe that we have some pandemic preparedness of our own that we should be addressing. First and foremost, as I mentioned last week, we all do need to prepare to preach, to make ourselves useful to the Lord by continuing to preach the gospel, focus on that first and foremost, to stay in God's will first and foremost, especially since one of the elements of our armor, our spiritual armor, is having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
as Paul says in Ephesians 6. We also do need to prepare to resist the devil and his new world order, saying no to all lockdown orders and mandates. Also, primary importance, as I have been saying for years now, for which some of you are still not prepared, is that we all have to have a fresh, a backup fresh water supply. You all need to have that. Again, if the electrical grid goes down, your submersible well pumps will cease to function, and I would not recommend that anyone rely on city water. I have a, had a handout today that I was going to talk about, but I may do that after, after uh, Mark's presentation, second hour, uh, to show you what I'm planning to do, and I've got some instructions for doing a, putting in a do-it-yourself well, which just takes a couple hundred bucks maybe, and maybe a day's worth of work, and it's not that hard to do. We put one in in, in Brooksville. And so uh, we all need to, again, be sure to keep plenty of liposomal vitamin C and zinc and quercetin on hand. With, I recommend every family have a nebulizer, hydrogen peroxide, and perhaps some iodine and invive MSP as well. Along with anything and everything else that we can think of to do our own doctoring at home, we'll need to do that. And what we do know is ultimately the devil will have his new world order. There will be a time on this earth when no man will be able to buy or sell legally without taking the mark of the beast. We've talked in the past about food canning, and I do recommend that you each take up the practice of canning food, including canning lots of meat, as we have done. Uh, when the grid goes down, we lose our freezers. Within a very short time, canned, dried, or salted meat is all we're going to have uh, for animal protein. Beans you can live on, you know, but... It's good to have canned meat. There are many other things I want to be sure that we're working on, being prepared for, but as mentioned up front, I don't want to steal Mark's thunder. So at this point, I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to have closing comments after Mark brings his message second hour. And y'all have any questions, we can have a time of discussion and talk about these things as well. So at this point, we'll go ahead and just take a break, and we will have a break, and then Mark's going to bring his presentation, all right? All right, very good. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about what a famine is and um, cases in the Bible where we see a famine occurring, a little bit about history of famines, and also about what we can do to uh, mitigate or uh, reduce our exposure um, to what might be coming in the foreseeable future. So I want to start out by reading Proverbs 19.15 which says, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Amen. All right. So what is a famine? A famine is a widespread food shortage leading to severe hunger and often even uh, death, unfortunately. What's that? Can we go back and sure. read that last line? All right. So I'll say again, what is a famine? A famine is a widespread food shortage leading to severe hunger and often uh, death. Throughout human history, famine, whether it's man-made or naturally made, um, has claimed nearly 100 million lives in the past 150 or so years. And it's a terrible thing, but we don't often think about it because here in America, when's the last time someone thought about famine? I mean, really. It's been close to 100 years before we've had any serious kind of famines occurring in the entire region. But it's something that is one of the most pernicious, harmful, devastating things that can happen uh, to a human being individually, but also as a people as well. However, and perhaps more importantly, spiritual famines have caused more souls to be lost than the number of lives lost. Amen. America has a vast majority, as the vast majority of the world as well, has been in the worst spiritual famine since the times of Noah. This spiritual famine will always lead to consequences and may very well be experienced in some form of a very real physical famine, Amen. among many. Throughout the Bible, there are many warnings about the consequences of being in a spiritual famine. In many instances, we see a spiritual famine leading to the consequences of literal famine, but also to pestilence, to bitterness, to strife, to violence, and ultimately death and the worst, separation from God. Amen. In Deuteronomy 2, sorry, Deuteronomy 8, beginning on verse 2, uh, the Lord tells us who feeds us 
and what food is best for us? What is our source of sustenance? So Deuteronomy uh, two, uh, sorry Deuteronomy eight two through four, uh, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what is in thine heart whether thou wouldst keep my commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Amen. So before we continue, why does famine occur? You know, in the audience want to say, why does a famine occur in nature? Anyone? In nature? In nature, yes. Drought. Drought, okay. So what is a drought? A lack of a lack of rain, a lack of water from heaven. It's like there's a an analogy in there, a metaphor perhaps. So John four seven, I'm gonna begin there. Uh, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Y'all have heard this, but I'll be quick about it. Uh, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, be, being a Jew, ask of the drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have, at, you know, wouldst have asked of me, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence um, then hast thou the, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank therefore himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, meaning the water in the well. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So once again, we're seeing that the source of everlasting life comes from the water that we can drink um, given to us by our Lord. So famine can happen, of course, from lack of rain, pestilence, and other causes that affect crop production. But famines can also be man-made. In fact, in the past hundred or so years, the famines that have occurred, the vast majority of them are man-made in some way. So war, for example, historically, throughout many, many years, uh, war disrupts the harvest, storage, and distribution of, of food. Furthermore, in wartime, crops and stores of food are often intentionally destroyed to harm the enemy. Okay? Withholding foods, this is in the Holodomor in Ukraine, a lot going on there, uh, was food withheld from these people. There was plenty of food, but it was withheld. So it's not just the production of it, it's also the distribution of it is extremely important. That's a very important point we need to be thinking about in the future is the distribution of of food. Here, for example, in the United States, our, I would say the average distance between uh, the food that's produced and reaching our grocery store is probably around 1,500 miles on average. So your corn in the Midwest, in the northern Midwest, your wheat is in the Midwest, a lot of your fruits and vegetables, unfortunately, are in California. Um, so we have a long distance between us and getting the food we actually need. So it's not, again, it's not a matter of production, it's a matter of distribution. Okay, and so governments have wielded these as weapons throughout history to say, you're not getting the food shipment okay, until you comply, until you bend the knee, or whatever kinds of uh, plans and schemes they have for them. That's quite an important kind of point uh, that we definitely need to remember. <clears throat> uh, so furthermore, it's used to, uh, to kill the enemy's people, to subjugate them, and also to drive starving masses of people into other people's lands and use these as almost like human weapons, whether they realize it or not. So we have plenty of examples of where people have journeyed uh, to uh, other lands in the Bible uh, to acquire food. Several instances of going to uh, Egypt, uh, for example, in times of famine. Uh, Joseph uh, organizing basically uh, a, a plan to, to basically prevent the people in Egypt and also people in the entire region um, from starving. 
For example, here, I'll go through several examples fairly quickly. In Genesis 12, 10, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. We also have another example of how famine caused food prices to increase dramatically. So while you might have um, what little food is available, the prices might be so outlandishly high that one cannot afford it. For example, in uh, 2 Kings 18.2, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So basically, uh, you might want to store up some food to avoid eating you know, a, a, uh, an old ass's head um, for, for food. So I like the idea of the saying, basically, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. Okay, So the idea is that it's better to have it now than the possibility of going out and getting things you think you might need Amen. in the future. All right, so it's very, very important. You know, you, you might have it, but if you don't have it on hand when you need it at the exact moment, um, it's, not of a, it's not of much value. Uh, we have further examples of how pride and foolishness, denying the Lord His due honor, have led to famine and to additional suffering. For example, in Jeremiah 5, 11 through 13, For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not He... Neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. And the prophet shall become wind, and the word... Oh, sorry, one second. Boop. Lost my order here. Yeah, okay, we're good. All right. And the prophet shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. We also have examples of how disobedience to the Lord and following false prophets. In Jeremiah 14, 11 through 13, we see examples where it says, um, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. We often see famine in conjunction with sword, war, and pestilence. We rarely see these completely isolated in many cases. For instance, and many people don't know this, but in Europe during World War II, there was localized famines... It was associated for no other reason than because of World War II occurring. Okay? Same case as well in World War I. We had uh, two horrible famines in Russia, probably because of the, uh, the Russian uh, communist revolutions that occurred there, but two, uh, two famines that occurred within less than 20 years, uh, totaling tens of millions of dead, many of which were children. So, continuing. Where are we? Ah, Okay. <laughs> and then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assurance, peace in this place. Basically, the false prophet saying this. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name, I sent them not. Neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom the prophecy shall cast out into the street of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword... They shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness unto them. All right. So you have a couple of examples of how not only physical famines have occurred throughout the Bible, but also a famine for lack of hearing God's words for them. For example, in Amos 8, chapter 8, uh, verses uh, 8 through 12, And I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring... Uh, up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, and I'll make it as the morning of an only son, and the end therefore as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Right. Continuing, it says in, uh, on chapter 12, 
And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall find shall not find it. So we're also told in Mark chapter 13, 7 through 8, to expect famines and troubles. I think Pastor Adams mentioned this briefly. But beginning in uh, Mark 13, chapter 7, And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must need be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. So, so there is also, I want to kind of mention that there is no refuge to be found outside of the Lord. There is no refuge to be found outside of the Lord. And when we get into a Revelation, very brief, I know Revelation is a very complicated um, uh, book, but within some degree of context, I want to read Revelation 18, 7, uh, beginning in 7. So, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. The kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning." So we also have examples of overabundance, and something that perhaps doesn't get enough attention is the topic of gluttony. And this is, uh, I'm trying to put it in some of your context, but again, we don't have a huge amount of time to get into every single little uh, nuance here. But in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 12, So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. And he made him ride on the high places of the earth, and that he might eat Uh, the increase of the fields. And he made him suck the honey out of the rock and the oil out of flinty rock, butter of kine, which is, you know, multiple uh, cattle, and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats and with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Deshuram waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, uh, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So in some cases, a gluttony and overabundance and overindulgence can make people uh, forget um, basically following uh, God. So we have another example or two. Basically, we have an example of spiritual famine that leads to hunger. So a spiritual famine that leads to hunger. We often see so many consequences. You cannot have a spiritual famine, a spiritual corruption, and then have uh, reaping a bounty. Okay, you're not going to have a, a situation where you benefit ultimately, that's the keyword ultimately, uh, from one's uh, spiritual famine. So, for example, we have one of the most famous ones is the prodigal son. And he would fain uh, have filled his belly with the husk of the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. All right? And kind of one last point I want to mention is about the idea of a daily sustenance. So one of my favorite examples is in, um, in John 6, verses 31, it talks about basically uh, the, the Israelites wandering and basically eating the, uh, the manna from heaven. So our fathers did eat a man in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my father give you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, 
And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Continuing down to verse six, uh, sorry, 46. Uh, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He that seeth the Father, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man eateth, may eateth thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give his give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. You don't have to accept it. You have to eat of it. So it's not blanketed it across the entire world. You actually have to consume it. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? The Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat, indeed, my blood is drink, indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As a living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is a bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live uh, forever. So one last point is that uh, I strongly believe that all heads of households, fathers, patriarchs, have a duty to provide and plan and protect for our families. Amen. All right. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 5, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house... He hath denied the faith and his worth in an infidel. Amen. That's pretty strong words. Like Joseph, we must be warned. And if we, uh, we have been warned, we have a duty not only to understand uh, purely in a spiritual context, but also acknowledge that there are physical things we must do. Okay? We have to plow the fields, we have to sow the corn, and we have to weed the fields and harvest it and store it and dry it. So there are many things we have to do. Okay? So these are the reason why I gave these examples because I don't want anyone to think that we should neglect um, basically uh, understanding that we need to avoid a spiritual famine. Okay, so that's just really important to understand is that we not uh, overemphasize uh, basically just purely physical preparedness and that's it because that is not the end game uh, that we're uh, aiming for. Amen. All right. So I have a couple of uh, hopefully important points when it comes to. Uh, actual physical preparedness. Now that we've talked a lot about hopefully spiritual preparedness, which is ultimately very important and must be constantly maintained. So with all this, it should be clear that the Lord desires for us to follow Him and for all of our sustenance. We should also acknowledge that we have a duty to gather fruits from the field. Okay, The Lord is not going to do that for us. We have to do that ourselves physically. Amen. Okay, We don't live in the Garden of Eden anymore, unfortunately. That'd be nice, um, but we have to, uh, to weed our field literally and metaphorically. Also, historically uh, and practically, then as now, we have a duty to prepare for what is obviously coming in the world. And I would argue that in, in many cases, people say, well, you know, I'm not going to spend lots of money for things I'm not going to use. So what I encourage people to do is look at the kind of things you use in a given day, in a given month, in a given year and acquire surplus while you still can, okay? If you like rice and beans, like I do, then it would be a good idea to store up rice and beans, okay? And we're going to get into some, a couple of specifics that I would strongly encourage everyone um, to have a plan and begin to take action because uh, there's few kinds of uh, panic and fear as knowing that you have not prepared um, for the benefit of your children and for your family. We do not want to find ourselves in that situation that is a horrible feeling, and uh, we need to take every action to avoid that. 
So once again, I would argue that it is not some, you're not spending things foolishly, you're not going out and, and buying things that you don't need. We're talking about buying things you do need, but simply in advance, okay? In ancient Egypt, they had enough food storage for seven years right. in advance. That's a, that's, a, that's a long time. Even I can't say that I have seven years of food. So in a very, very generic, um, we're talking ballparking here, but the average person, average size, is going to need about 1,800 to 2,200 calories per day, every day, to maintain your weight, to maintain uh, some minimum physical capabilities. All right? So if you're going to be doing that, it's going to be roughly about a pound, a pound and a half of rice and beans and other supplementals per person per day. Okay? So if you have five people in your family, that's around average, let's say, seven and a half pounds uh, per person, 10 days, you're now at 70 pounds, okay? That adds up pretty fast. So, uh, so that's very, very important to understand what the calorie needs are and also to understand what our children need, okay? So children need a little bit less calories, but they're going to consume more and more as they get older. I know my son eats almost as much as a grown man in, uh, in some cases. So he's a, he's a grown boy, and so his needs are, are fairly, uh, fairly high. So first and foremost, what... what uh, stays off starvation is going to be lots of calories. And one of the, both historically and also currently, and still is, one of the best ways to store healthy calories is in the form of dry grains. Okay, so dry grains, this includes wheat, corn, barley, oats, and perhaps most available is rice. Okay, so when you store these properly, we'll get very briefly into how to store these. Let me know if I'm okay on time. Okay, very good. So when it comes to storage of grains, um, I work a lot in uh, pest control and whatnot, and there's a lot of ways it can spoil. Okay? One of those common ways it can spoil is any moisture is going to allow for microbes to decay it. Fungus, bacteria can get in there, it spoils it, it contaminates it, you can't eat it. Another perhaps most commonly is insects. Insects and rodents will find a way to get in, and they will spoil it, and we don't want to be eating the excrement of either of these in our, in our grains, so it's very, very important that we store these properly. So you might be asking, well, how do you store these properly? There are many ways to store these. I won't get into how the ancient Egyptians and ancient uh, peoples uh, stored grains. It's pretty interesting. But the way that we can store grains is fairly simple. A food-grade bucket, five-gallon bucket, whatever you can uh, acquire, as long as it has a sealable lid, ideally with a gasket, that's one of the best ways to, to store grains over the long term. Okay? So one big factor is um, the reason why we put a lot of oxygen absorbers in these is because uh, over time oxidation can degrade the quality of food. That's where you get spoilage from. It hasn't been spoiled from microbes. It has basically an off taste. It's often from oxidation. And if you probably had oils that are, uh, that are too old, they taste uh, kind of off. That's been from oxidation. So it's very important that we store our foods as dry as possible, keeping them away from pestilence, so physically sealing the food up, all right? And also reducing oxygen. So if you put a gasketed seal on that lid and you put the oxygen absorbers in there and it's been thoroughly dehydrated, most grains should last minimum 25 years to indefinitely, okay? You could probably eat the grains found in ancient Egyptian tombs going back 4,000 towards 5,000 years, okay? Uh, hopefully, we're not going to be having to store food that long, uh, but I do expect that we will need it perhaps in the foreseeable future. And if we are fortunate enough not to be in the generation that experiences these, uh, these kinds of uh, calamities, then we still have food stored up. We can crack into it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. There are people who may be in need you come across you can give this food to. Okay, so there's many, many uses. You're not going to be losing anything by storing food, by storing things that you're going to need you know, basically tomorrow by storing them today. So another point is that if you look at the cost of food, historically the cost of food has been the cheapest it's almost ever been in human history, other than the Garden of Eden where it was free. All right? So these days it is still incredibly cheap. I know it doesn't seem cheap these days, but I assure you it is from a historical standpoint. Um, I would say around 35 to 40 percent of people's income historically has been dedicated just to purchasing food. Okay, so that's a really important point that if you can get it now, it's better to get it now than try to uh, hope for it um, later. So if anyone has any questions for basically food stores when it comes to grains, please let me know. I'll be happy to talk about it afterwards. But when you store these, these will be good for a very, very long time. 
Also, there's a bunch of other items that can that are kind of either our foods or related to foods that will store pretty much indefinitely. Uh, sugar stores indefinitely. That is a source of calories. It's not ideal. I don't want to promote that as being the singular source of calories one should be, uh, be getting. Uh, but it will store indefinitely. It doesn't spoil. It is very slightly hydroscopic, which means it absorbs water. So you want to keep that sealed uh, as much as possible. You even can put in some of those basically humidity reducing uh, uh, packets as well, get that uh, water out. Um, also salt. Salt does not have a shelf life. It has no expiration date. Um, it could be here for the next 10,000 years and it could not have any issues whatsoever. So salt is incredibly cheap for now. In ancient times, salt was not cheap. Salt was a very laborious process um, to bring to the market. But these days, you can go down to most hardware stores and get a 50, what is it, about really 50 pounds or 40 pounds uh, bag of salt, and it might be less than you know, eight or so dollars, maybe cheaper than that. All right, so that's a lot of salt, more salt than you'll probably need in your entire lifetime. You can purchase in one single go, and you can leave it in a, uh, in a bucket, seal it up, and it should be fine. Uh, for quite some time. So also, one kind of point that I think is also very important is not just the acquisition of food, but also to understand that we need to be taking care of our health as much as we possibly can Amen. while we can. Right. Okay? So I think, I mean, not only from a spiritual point of view, but I also think that you know the, the temple of our souls you know, needs to be respected and we should not be putting in inputs like excessive alcohol, or any alcohol for that matter, or smoking, or things that cause our body harm. These are all kinds of things that people do. We shouldn't be doing these kind of things, okay? You need to stay away from the kind of things that cause our bodies harm. And also, one kind of point is that when we're overindulging in foods, uh, in many cases that we find that our, our vision, uh, basically staying our eyes on God, is dimmed quite a bit. That's why fasting is, I think, an important component. It's not a Amen. necessary, an absolute you know, a necessity, but it is something that happens again and again and again in both the Old Testament and the New, uh, because in many ways our minds are clarified uh, on the Lord when we are fasting. Amen. Okay? So that, this fasting is a whole long kind of a topic, a very, very interesting topic. Uh, but we don't want to be fasting for, uh, for seven years, um, so hopefully we can find ways right. um, to avoid that. Um, so when it comes, again, to, to health, it's not just our health, but also I would argue it's important to have some degree of physical fitness because when we talk about the tools and things we need, our body is the ultimate tool and the first tool we carry on us at all times. We have our mind that controls the body, and if our body is not healthy, if it's infirm, if it is uh, inflamed and we haven't been taking care of it, uh, then we're not going to be of much use. We cannot do what we need to do um, out in the, in the physical uh, kind of world. So taking care of our health and taking care of our bodies and to some degree of uh, physical fitness, I think, is, is quite important for those who can uh, get physically fit. I totally understand. All right, so we talked about basically dry grains that last a very long time. So grains are a source of calories. That is your source of energy. That is what gives you ultimately glucose. It makes all the mechanisms of your cells move. You have to have glucose to move, okay? But to maintain the structure of your body or to build the structure of your body, you're going to need protein and a bunch of other uh, vitamins and minerals. So one of the absolute easiest things to store for the long, uh, long term is going to be beans and peas and equivalent that are dry, okay? So if you dry them and you store them and you put some oxygen absorbers in there, they should last for many decades, all right? So that's a really important point. So you have your grains, that is your calories, that is the most base of what you need to keep moving. And then to support your body's physical structure, your musculature, and grow muscle, you're going to need uh, protein. Protein is also very important for other mechanisms uh, throughout our body. Uh, so those are really important to, to store those uh, as well. So other things that store pretty much indefinitely is honey. So honey will last an extremely long time as long as you keep it airtight. Because if you have it open to the air, uh, sugar is, as I mentioned before, it's hydroscopic, meaning that it absorbs moisture out of the air, especially high humidity moisture. We're in Florida. We get a lot of humidity, and so you're going to have the concentration of sugar will actually decrease as the water content increases, and then you can get fermentation and spoilage of your honey. So if you leave honey open, it absorbs the water, decreases the, uh, the salt, sorry, decreases the sugar concentration to the point where it, it uh, will not prevent microbial growth, and then you can get spoilage and it tastes uh, quite terrible. Still edible, but would not, would not recommend it. 
Um, also, if you do see some crystallization in sugar, um, sugar is a, um, has multiple different kinds of, well, sugars in there. So you have glucose, you have, uh, let's see here, uh, you have sucrose to some extent, uh, but those crystallizations are typically going to be uh, glucose crystals. Okay, and the reason why glucose crystals really matter is because in some off instance, you find someone who's in a hypoglycemic uh, situation, then administering, you're trying to find some glucose. You probably heard of glucose bringing people out of um, diabetic uh, comas or, you know, kind of a um, extremely low blood sugar. Uh, glucose is almost instantaneously available to you. So if you have some crystallized uh, honey around the house, you find, you open your, your pantry, you find some crystallized honey, that crystal is, the vast majority of those crystals are in fact going to be crystallized glucose. So if you're wondering where you got your glucose from, immediately you have uh, honey. It's not going to hurt anything to, uh, to consume uh, crystallized honey whatsoever. All right, so also uh, I do recommend that people acquire a means of protection. There's all kinds of ways to interpret that. It is locks on your door. It is, you know, security lights. It can be potentially a weapon if you need it. If anyone does choose to acquire a weapon uh, for self-defense, my recommendation is that you have a mastery of it. The safety first to be able to use it very effectively. The mere possession of of a weapon or mere possession of anything is not some magical talisman. Just having it in your possession is not good enough. You need to be able to, how to use these tools Amen. very effectively. They are nothing more than tools. And uh, the most important way for, for safety is basically avoiding conflict when you can. So if you look at crime maps, if you look at the time of day when most crime occurs, what we're concerned about is random crime. Okay, because the majority of crime, believe it or not, is actually related to people that you know, but also often related to uh, drug use, to alcohol abuse, to gang involvement, that kind of stuff. And so that doesn't really concern most of it. I assume none of us are in any kind of gangs or anything in here. Hopefully not. Uh, but the point is that based, in, based on the time of day, any time is after, um, after dark, the crime, random acts of crime skyrocket through, through, the, uh, through the roof, okay? So, so that's what I mean by self-defense. is isn't purely just for me a weapon, like I have a, a weapon and that's it. It is using your brain to avoid or to mitigate the chances of encountering uh, random acts of criminality as best we can, all right? There's all kinds of, a long topic on that. We can get into more uh, perhaps later. But again, if you are going to use something, uh, make sure you have a... Um, uh, you know how to use it safely, and you store it safely. In general, I highly recommend that every family uh, develops a thorough and customized preparedness plan. Basically, if people have medical needs, uh, how are you going to acquire enough medication for six months, for a year, potentially? You might want to have to go to a doctor to get these kinds of things if you do take medication. Um, understand that you're probably going to need to keep some of your vital documents. You might want to have a binder. I have a binder back home where everything we have that's essential is in a locked binder inside of a locked case. So if I need to get it within 10 seconds, I have every major document that I need and I can leave. It's kind of frustrating if you have a house fire or, heaven forbid, we need to migrate to a different area. It'd be good to have a lot of these essential documents to make our lives a lot easier. We want to reduce our stress as much as possible and also reduce the stress for our family and especially our children as well because they can't handle it as well as we can. So um, in general, uh, I do have a, uh, a very quick warning also on the notion that gardening is going to provide for our uh, dietary needs. Gardening is great. Gardening is fantastic. I recommend that everyone is growing as much food as they possibly can. But when you do the math on the amount of calories that the average person consumes in a given day, again, about 2,200 calories on average, minimum, and you look at what you're going to find in, like, say, one sweet potato, you're going to be getting roughly two large sweet potatoes per person every single day. Okay, so if you have a family of five, that's at least 10 large potatoes or large sweet potatoes every single day. Multiply that by 10 days, it's 100. Okay, it adds up very, 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 very fast. Okay? So I do not want people to have, unless you have already weaned yourself off of going to the market, I do not recommend assuming that having a packet of seeds and a gardening hoe is going to, to save you from any kind of starvation. It is far more difficult than, than I can really describe unless you have done it yourself and harvested hundreds if not thousands of pounds of food per year, then I would start trying now because otherwise it is not good to try it in the midst of a famine. 
That is not the time I'd recommend doing so. All right. So in summary, uh, the whole topic of water is, is a separate time. But in summary, we need to find ways to procure and assure we have access to clean water, clean drinking water, so we can get you know distant other things. So clean water, uh, food storage, medical supplies that we might need, medication that we might need, also maximizing our health while we can. Whenever we're in a stress state, our cortisol levels spike and our muscle wasting increases, our sleep patterns uh, deteriorate. Um, it's in general, when we're under stress, it is a generally unhealthy kind of environment to be in. So we need to maximize our health while we can before especially hard times um, occur. Also, when it comes to acquiring kind of a plan, we want to make sure we uh, have a plan for hygiene. So one of the biggest issues with civilization is hygiene and making sure that all the kinds of diseases that are flushed away maintain flushed away. So we need to have a plan uh, for hygiene, especially for little children that are highly susceptible to diarrhea and other kinds of uh, uh, basically gut and, um, and stomach kinds of pathogens. Very, very important to have a plan for that. To maintain cleanliness is very important for our health as well. Also, of course, have a plan for self-defense. I also would recommend some degree of a plan for potential communication. Not actually communication as in like a ham radio, but communication in the sense that you already have a plan that say if we've lost communication for say seven days, that we can go to a, a similar location and we can leave a note there or we can communicate in that way. So having a plan, an action plan, it could be as very bit as useful as having a, a radio that can contact someone from hundreds or thousands of miles away. So I would recommend that people have an action plan that customizes their specific needs. There is no absolute customized plan that, you know, that I have that is going to work for anyone else. Okay, so everyone needs to have their own kind of a plan and look at, again, what you need in a given day, in a given week, in a given month. Look at the needs of your family for yourself and plan accordingly. That's about all I have for now uh, on that one. If anyone has any questions, feel free to let me know now or afterwards. But uh, this is a very, very long topic we get into, but hopefully I covered most of the essential bases. Any questions for now? Yeah, I got a question. First of all, um, salt. Is it best to store iodized salt or not? Uh, it really doesn't matter that much, from what I understand. It, the, the major sources of iodine are going to be fishes and in um, basically vegetables that come from good quality soil. Florida doesn't have the best quality soil. Um, so your, your leafy greens and your anything from the ocean is going to have more than adequate amounts of iodine in it. It doesn't really hurt to have iodized salt. A little here, a little there is not going to hurt anything. But any kind of salt is better than no salt. But iodized salt is not an absolute priority. I'd recommend this, um, the, kind of, I, the kind I have is just like rock salt. You can just yeah. crush it up in a mortar and pestle, and now you have all the salt you need. Very good. Other question. Well, this isn't a question. Can you repeat, uh, as you covered a couple years ago, um, that some of us didn't hear that, hmm. uh, the best way to store rice if, when you're going to put it in vacuum bags? Oh, sure. Okay. So if you haven't stored large quantities of rice before or any kind of grain, which is, this is suitable for, uh, my recommendation, the premium way to do it, is to get a five-gallon Mylar bag. Okay, these, the prices have gone up, unfortunately, quite a bit um, over the past couple of years for good reason. Whenever you see the prices go up for certain kinds of items, there might be something to that. It might be kind of a warning for you all. Um, so a five-gallon Mylar bag is ideal. It doesn't have to be exactly five gallons, but five gallons is good for a five-gallon bucket. You take your Mylar bag, you put it into a bucket, you kind of uh, move it around the lip of it so it's nice and kind of open in the middle. And you pour as much rice as you possibly can in there. What I like to do is I like prep to... Prep it first. What's that? Prep it first. How, how do you... Uh... How do I prep it? By heating it up. Uh, oh, yeah. I was, just gonna, I was just about to say it. Yeah. So what I recommend for, for my rice, what I do, is I will put it in the oven at about 155 for maybe half an hour or so. And that drives away the last bit of remaining water that might be in the grains. A tiny fraction of water is left, but you want as little as possible. In addition to that, if you have any... Uh, any kind of microbes or bugs or any kind of things in there, they're going to be killed off. So insects die at about 125 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, 100% mortality rate for these insects. And so if you heat to 155, it's more than enough range. But also at about 155 degrees or so, you're not going to have any kind of chemical changes happening inside the grains themselves. I mean, maybe over like a year or so that happened. But the point is that I like to keep in there for half an hour, 45 minutes, about 155 degrees. 
and then I immediately pour it from, going from the oven's large uh, kind of bowls, you know, metal bowls, I'll pour it directly into the Mylar bags, which are sitting in the bucket, and so it's quite, uh, it's quite hot. And then I'll get a, uh, you can get a vacuum sealer, you can get a literal vacuum to suck away as much uh, clean head of the vacuum as much as possible. And before you do that, you put in the appropriate volume of uh, oxygen absorbers. So an oxygen absorber will say is like 500 cc or 5,000 cc for cubic centimeters. And so you can figure out roughly what is the volume of your bucket and appropriately put in the oxygen absorbers to absorb any kind of oxygen that might be in, in, that, uh, in that container. Okay, so once you put in the oxygen absorbers, it's still hot. You seal it as fast as you possibly can because if you have oxygen absorbers and you break that seal for the oxygen absorber, it is beginning to basically react with the air immediately. So within like five or so minutes, a large portion of that potency has been reduced. So you, you break the seal, you stick it in there uh, while it's still hot, and you get as much air out of it as possible, and then you seal it up, you put your lid on top, you can even use a silicon caulking if you want to. Ideally, you want to have a gasket on that lid, and you hammer that lid with a rubber mallet, and that should stay good for, for many many years. So I have a friend of mine who tested some out. They were over, I think, uh, 10 to 12 years old. I helped them uh, uh, bag it uh, that long ago, and the, the food quality tastes as fresh as the day it was put in. Mm -hmm. Okay? So hopefully that, uh, that answered your question about the, uh, uh, I like to add to that. the bucket. Uh, I, my rice storage, I have used smaller bags. Yeah, you can do that, of course. You can do that, too. You know, the machine you get at Sam's Club, the yeah. vacuum packer. And I use that because I would rather have lots of small bags mm -hmm. so that when you open it, you're not opening the entire bucket yeah. and, and subjecting it you know, to exposure. And this is a lot of extra work to make five or six or ten bags, <laughs> which I've done. Yeah, <laughs> and there's only two of us. Yeah. yeah. So it's a matter of your choice. You want to use a smaller bag, have a bunch of bags in there, or you can store them other kind of ways, or you can have one large bag. It's at your discretion about what your time and your budget are, because it might be more expensive per bag. If they're smaller, and really cheaper if you get one large bag. I don't know. But that's kind of up your your discretion about whatever you think is best. Anything else? Any kind of questions on this topic? Food storage, medical, self-defense, a plan, health, all those kinds of things. I it's important. Um, there's long-term food storage you can get that has a long shelf life. Oh, yeah. You can get a freeze-dried food. Freeze-dried foods in general last far longer than more of the conventional cans. Well, cans are better than nothing. If you, that's all you have access to. Uh, but freeze-dried foods, in many cases, depending upon the actual contents, will often last indefinitely. So for the next... 100 years, you crack it up, you rehydrate it, it's just as good as the day it was stored. They, they say 20 years, but you're right, it'll go well. Yeah, anything that has like a 25 year shelf life, I can assure you it could be 75 or, or 100 years. And they have plenty of instances of that. Yeah, that should be fine, yes. As long as it's completely dehydrated, uh, it is often very expensive on a per calorie kind of a basis. It's about like raisins and prunes, what's the shelf life? Okay, so those are not truly dehydrated, they're just kind of uh, somewhat of the, the water is reduced. But if you were to look at the actual water content, it's probably 25% moisture. Dehydrated food is as dehydrated as it's going to possibly be where it's like 1%, maybe 2% water still remains locked inside that food. Then you have to, you have to soak it to yeah. reconstitute it. Yeah, you usually boil it or whatever to reconstitute it. But things like raisins, figs, and equivalent, um, those should be okay. But usually, those, if these have been open and exposed to the air, those will often get moldy after a period of time. So I said the shelf life for most dried fruit but not dehydrated fruit, there's a, there's a difference, um, is going to be probably about two to three years. You can probably stretch it out a bit longer, but anything beyond that, especially if you open it, it's going to be exposed to the oxygen. It can get a, an off taste to it. And also uh, specialized fungi will get in there, and they can uh, do a pretty good job of living off of even dried fruit, but not dehydrated fruit. That's why you know, reducing the exposure to uh, high humidity air is extremely important. So sealing it back up is important as well. All right. Yes, sir, in the back. I like how you tied in spiritual famine with, with physical because Amen. that's exactly what's happening right now. 100%. Where we are preparing the, the ingredients for a physical famine. That's right. Yeah, as a, as a manifest, as a consequence of the spiritual famine uh, that is going on. It's just, uh, uh, it's, it's sad to see that so many people don't see what is, what is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, I think it's a matter of when. Yeah. Also, too, it's good for us to learn how to make fires, too, because we're going to have to cook the food. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Plenty of wood and all that stuff. That's right. To make fires. So. That's right. 100%. For all the neighbors, too. 
Well, if you use a coal fire, there's there's ways to uh, to do it. Yes, you had a question. Yes. Uh, after like you prepare the buckets with the food. Label it. You want to make sure it's labeled because I have okay. not labeled a few buckets and I'm like. Uh, how do you store it? Can they be stored in a? Does it have to be in a cool dark area? Great question. So ideally, so any kind of food that potentially can spoil. Um, largely through oxidation and other kind of uh, chemical uh, breakdown. Some foods do break down chemically if they have any moisture in them uh, slowly. Like, you know, oils can go rancid, for example. Um, so cool as possible. So if you can get it hypothetically freezing, most foods, even if they could spoil in a normal kind of atmosphere, it will stay good for a super long time. So cool as possible reduces the chemical reactions that are taking place in food that can spoil. Okay, so cool, dry place would be ideal. In a garage is not ideal. Some grains will do okay uh, if it's really, really uh, dehydrated, like put it into the uh, an oven and uh, further uh, dehydrating it. But things like salt, sugar, uh, freeze-dried food will last perfectly fine in a, in a warmer um, kind of conditions. So cool as possible will make all of your foods uh, that can spoil last much, much longer by a factor of like 10 in many cases. Yeah, really, really important. And also, one more point is that I've seen cases where uh, people will store these really heavy buckets on top of one another. So you have like four buckets tall, each weighs about 75 pounds or more. Now, if you, have, you fill it, depending on what you're filling it with, like, you know, say salt, for instance, is pretty heavy for five gallons. And that the lids will often crack, and you defeat the whole purpose of storing food when, you, when that lid cracks and it breaks through or even topples over. That can be a problem. So my recommendation is to have, if you have like four or whatever kind of configuration you want, you can put a, um, you can put basically a piece of plywood or equivalent over them, so it distributes the, the uh, basically the pressure more evenly. Yeah. So you're not going to have that cracking occur. So they, they looks like they fit nicely on top of one another without that, but they are prone to cracking in time. So you have like a warm uh, garage or whatnot. I have plenty of people I know who yeah, you have yeah. just cracks right yeah, through, and it creates yeah. a problem. So that's why you can get. A, a piece of uh, thin ply, thin piece of plywood. It's like you know, three ply at most, and you're perfectly fine. Cut it to size, uh, and you can go from there. Yes. One last question. Uh, you mentioned rice. Um, is there any difference in the preparation with versus brown rice versus white rice? In general, I don't really recommend brown rice as much as the more white rice, and the reason why is because they have more oil content to them, and they have they're more likely to uh, and also higher. Uh, water content in general. Um, so my recommendation is stay away from brown rice because there are potential um, to basically spoil and go rancid. You ever heard of like rice oil or rice bran oil, that kind of stuff? And it's often found more in the brown rice. All right, so that can spoil and it will go bad. You still have the calories in there, but you're gonna have a rancid taste after you know five or ten years of brown rice. So I do not recommend brown rice if we can keep it. Anything that has oils in it, uh, I recommend trying to stay away from it as much as possible. So oils, do not have a great shelf life uh, in most cases. There's a few exceptions, but I really do not recommend a lot of oils or foods that contain oils. You're not going to store some like lasagna, for instance, probably not the best. You know, uh, if it's like in a, uh, you know, it, freeze dried, it might be okay. But uh, anything that has oils and it can spoil a lot of seeds, not grains, but like more of the oily kind of seeds, they are likely to spoil uh, very, very likely. And it tastes terrible. And they're edible. Well, so you rest rice. If you if you want the best quality rice, it has to be brown rice because white rice used to be brown rice, but they removed the hull, the, the, the hull right? The, the outer I think shell. the bran, that's what they're the talking bran, about. Yeah. The rice bran, yeah. they removed it, and so now it's white. Yeah. But the white rice used to be brown, and they removed the healthiest part because it keeps better. 100%. It's exactly the reason why they yeah. do that. Yeah. Then they give it to livestock often. They don't completely waste it. But the point is that you're you're correct. No, no, they, they, they actually take that stuff and sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sell the rice. Right? Do they really? As a specialty. That's interesting. High, I wonder how long high uh, nutrition food. <laughs> yeah. so I wonder how how long brown rice would last as opposed to the white rice. That's a factor of time, heat, and presence of oxygen. Right. So if you can have store it in a very very cold environment. And, and vacuum pack it, deprive it of, uh, of oxygen uh, as best you possibly can. I, I'm going to give you a ballpark. Probably 10 to 15 years yeah. would be good, which is a pretty that's long time. Good. Yeah. Yeah. But not okay. the you. preferred method. That's, yeah. that, that's still... That, that's, that's, that's plenty. That's, that's, that's yeah. Point, 10 to 15 years, that's still very, yeah. very useful. Yeah. That's still, that's right. Under ideal conditions, of course. But in a garage... 
probably not the best kind of a what situation. What about when you buy like the, like the Spanish rice and the yeah. rice and beans that are sealed already in the Mylar packaging? How long, so long as that packaging doesn't break, that should be... It should be good for a while, but not indefinitely kind of thing. So I'd say several years, sure. Okay. Three, four, five, seven years, probably. Uh, but for long term, it probably will have an off uh, taste to it, a rancid kind of a taste. Not, not a completely inedible, but not the best preferred thing. And that's also a really minor point in all this is a, a term called palatability. I work with a lot of livestock. And so palatability is important because um, I, I suppose hunger is the best spice. But at the same time, uh, you want things you're actually going to consume freely and not have to like laboriously try to shovel it in when it tastes off, for instance. So the kind of things that you would consume... So my recommendation is to look for people, what it, look at their, uh, what they consume in a given month, look at their grocery bill, and look at the things on there that you commonly will eat, and look at the things that can be stored for the long term, and find supplementals for the things in between for the calorie gaps or nutritional gaps that you might find in there. So that's what I, kind of what I do, is that I, everything that I have stored is the things I commonly consume. So it's not like some new thing my, my kids are going to have to adjust to. It's already good to go. But if you do have very young children, or even uh, babies, uh, formula and equivalent. A lot of those dried, um, basically powdered milk, uh, as long as it's stored in really good containers, in one of those kind of foil containers, and the sometimes they'll actually pump in nitrogen and instead of uh, having this oxygen, you know, air. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, so that might be able to last upwards of five years or so. So, if you have that's really calorie dense kind of stuff, and some of those kind of workout supplement things, those often, if they're stayed stored, they, those are mostly um, away. Uh, those should stay good for at least three, maybe even four years in cool conditions in a sealed state. Okay, once you open them up, whole different ball game. That's a good source of calories and for protein as well. Yeah, we'll just, yeah but not a super long shelf life. Five, maybe seven years under good conditions. There. Oh, certainly. Thank you very you much, Mark. It? That was wanna... great. Very good. Very good. All right. Just a couple more things. I love that line, hunger is the best spice. <laughs> That'll preach. All right. Uh, just a couple things. We all know that uh, the Bible tells us over and over that when we see danger approaching, we are expected, really by the Lord, to prepare to the extent that we are able to protect our families from, from danger, as Mark quoted there. A man that doesn't provide for the needs of his own household is worse than an infidel. And so we all have to do that. We know Proverbs 22, 3. We know the verse. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And fools ignore these warnings and just go on, and they don't do anything to prepare. And then, like the ten virgins, you know, that Jesus talked about. Five, five foolish that didn't take oil for their lamps. And so... 1 Corinthians 14, 8 also says that if, a tr- if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, how shall the people prepare themselves to the battle? And most churches today are giving a very uncertain sound. They're not warning their people of these things, not warning their congregations of what's coming. Many are instead telling their members to trust the government, right? And that Romans 13 says we're supposed to do whatever the government says. And so the Baptist Church we met in there for a while, met in their gymnasium over there. They were telling their people, I mean, they had a, they had a vaccine drive at their church, and they all had to wear a mask to church, and they shut the church down for a while. And a lot of churches are doing this, telling their people to trust the government. Much to the contrary, our eyes are open to the fact that the federal government in Washington, D.C. has, in this nation, become the enemy of the people. Amen. It is the enemy of the people. And so as mentioned earlier, we, I believe, may well be facing many of these evils this year and maybe very soon, partly as a result of those presently in power in Washington, D.C., having sold their souls to the devil and selling this country out to the U.N. and the WHO to implement world government. But that has happened because, for the most part, the people on this land have turned from God, and the people will get the government that they deserve. And this nation deserves the judgment of Almighty God to fall on it because of the, the spiritual famine that's in the land. And so, but thank God the Lord has opened our eyes to these things. Amen. Amen. 
And uh, so we all need to be about the business of preparing for things that we see coming. In Joseph's day, the Lord gave Pharaoh a warning through Joseph of the famine to come. But he gave Pharaoh seven years to prepare. You know, seven years of plenty. I don't think we have that. I don't think we have seven years to prepare for a tribulation period that for us could last uh, at you know, minimum three and a half years. All right, so we need to be about the business of preparing. The Lord is our provider, we know. None of us need to freak out about these things. We need to prepare as the Lord enables us. And, of course, Mary and I have found that the Lord is able to multiply our storage when we, when we need it. All right, Mary and I, for uh, the first few years we pastored this church, we learned how to go day to day, hand to mouth, didn't we? And we trusted the Lord. The Lord Jesus says we're not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has sufficient care for itself. But that we will always have his promise that he is our provider, and if we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, he'll always provide what we need. That's what we need to do, stay in the center of his will, seek his kingdom and his, his uh, righteousness first. Seek to be holy, seek to be righteous. That's the main thing here. And then hunger is the best spice. I love that, Mark. Thank you. I really appreciate that presentation. Thank you. A lot of thought went into that. Amen. And we can do more in days to come. I do want to encourage you guys handed out uh, instructions there on how to put in your own well with nothing more than water pressure from two hoses. And I've got some, I've got some of the, uh, the gadgets and implements